Legitimate peripheral participation in communities of practice using role play uh, to reimagine history instruction and actually, for that matter, um, uh, computer science instruction or games development uh, instruction. Um, that's a lot of technical jargon in there that uh, we will not worry about too much in this talk, but uh, I can explain it if you like at any point. Um, Jonathan Truitt and Adrian Decker are my partners in crime in this endeavor. Um, and this endeavor is primarily an attempt to bring uh, practice education as opposed to field education um, into, into life. And what I mean by that is uh, we, we often think of education as teaching somebody about a field of study, right? History, um, English, literature, uh, you know, German language as a, as a construct of um, knowledge, right? But these constructs of knowledge are put into practice. German language is uh, really, language study is usually pretty good at having people engage in communication that is somewhat legitimate the kind of communication that they would want to engage in if they were to go to Germany and talk to Germans. And that's a practice, that's engaging in practice. When we are talking about history, and when we're talking about, when we're talking about history, so often we completely align the practice, right? We're talking about history as a set of knowledge, not as a research endeavor, right? When we're talking about an English 12 or even higher ed, until you get to much higher ed. So uh, why, why are we doing that? I have no idea. Let's change it, right? Let's use LARP as a, a method of changing that, or at least challenging it. Um, when it comes to game development, which is my primary field right now, uh, we do this all the time. We have them develop games as part of game development, so it's a much na more natural fit. As a result, I'm going to talk about history a lot more than I'm talking about game development in this talk, but we can wrap back around to that. Um, right, so here it is, pra two practices. Um, that have very little in common most of the time, but uh, we're going to use methods that make them tied together pretty nicely. Um, I want to talk through these methods. This is not a solved problem. I'm not pretending it is. Uh, I want to bring up a bunch of ideas, and uh, hopefully we can talk about them for the rest of the day, the week, the month, the year, the rest of our lives. Um, so, you know, I want to bring this up and, and, and talk our way through it. Okay, so uh, story time. History, story time. There's this course in World History One. World History One is taught by almost every university in the country and probably in the world, although but I can't be certain of that. It's a terrible course, right? It's awful. <laughs> but we think it's important because people ought to have some foundation in some in breadth of history before they start diving in, or as they're diving into other depth of history, right? So we think it's important, but we acknowledge it's terrible. So how do we? use what's good and mitigate what's bad uh, in this impossible task of taking history from 10,000 BC, well, 12,000 years ago, to 500 years ago. 12,500 years of history in a semester, or a year if you're in secondary ed. Um, it begins to look something like that. <laughs> If we're lucky, because that was at least a little entertaining. Um, fortunately, there are there are some examples of uh, history. These happen to be two professors of mine when I went through. I got a history bachelor's degree, um, among others. No, I, I've got a history, history and philosophy bachelor's degree. My history mentors were these two guys that uh, lectured a lot, and we had a lot of discussions. But they also taught me that there was a lot more to history than just lectures and discussions. We did a bunch of. My wife has excellent planning. <laughs> we did a bunch of research together. And that's really what I want to get at, because this is often what history looks like for us in uh, courses, and this is not terrible, right? You can actually have a good lecture. I'm gonna, I mean, shocking, I know. But you can actually have a good lecture. If you're engaged in the topic, you can really care about what you're hearing, and if you can have good transition of knowledge, and you can even engage with that knowledge, and it can be interactive in a sense. Uh, even before you get to questions. So often it looks more like this. Our classes look more like this, where you're staring down at a test. Um, I, we should actually have somebody in the back sleeping. Uh, you know, the, the people aren't engaged. They're there because they have to be. Even in higher ed, they're often there because they have to be in our history classes. So it doesn't have to be that way. 
or at least you can offer people good reasons to be the engaged folks rather than the disengaged folks. And maybe part of that would be getting our bodies moving, uh, showing people some context, um, giving them some reasons to care, and not just throwing a bunch of facts at them. But that's part of what I want to talk through. So, can we create an early world history curriculum that engages, informs, and is retained better than our traditional lecture, text, paper, test formula in history? Um, it's in development. It's not done. But we have playtested some of these ideas several times um, where we're working toward an actual product that we can then test. Um, and we're drawing on uh, a number of, of people that have tried very similar things in the past or are, are thinking our way through it at the moment. Um, we have some challenges. We are trying to, we're not trying to talk about an optimal classroom. We're, talking, we're trying to talk about classrooms in reality. Classrooms in reality have uh, a lot of diversity. They're in diverse spaces. Some of them are like this. Some of them are tables. Some of them are, uh, you know, history is not typically taught in a studio space, a studio theater space, but that would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, and it might be optimal for what we're doing. But, you know, usually we don't get that. We get this room. Uh, diverse scale. We might have 15 people. We might have 30. We might have 270. Um, that's a lot of, from a game design standpoint, that's a lot of flexibility built in. We've got to do it. We, we don't really have a choice. If we're going to be relevant, we have to have that flexibility. It has to be reasonable addition to the teacher's workload. In other words, it has to not be an addition. It has to be a replacement for something they're doing right now. Because teachers work are already crazy. Right? Um, have we succeeded at this? We're talking through the problem. <laughs> we'll see. We think we've got some ideas about how to go forward. Um, but uh, I think it's unproven at this point. Because uh, if nothing else, that last one is a real challenge. Because so few people, especially in the United States, have a familiarity with life. So who are we targeting? Right now we're targeting pre-history, pre-service history teachers. We want to get the history teachers knowledgeable and on board so that they can then bring it into the classroom. So we're starting with the teachers. Okay, we've got a lot of demands on us, our learning goals. Here they are, I'm not going to read through them. Top those evaluators. Okay, no evaluation skill. There are a lot of demands that we have in, uh, in what we're doing. These are actually, this is an important list that we don't have time to talk through. I'd be happy to talk through why we have to address these. But I want to talk about a couple um, specifically. I'm going to skip a little of this due to time. We need to deal with, um, we need to deal with specifically the practice of history, what people do as historians for part of our time. And we have to do with the context of history, what's happening in cultures for part of our time. We feel we can do practice in short bursts that then feed into the, the context, uh, the, the cultural context period of it. So this is our, what our semester or year is what our course looks like. A little bit of uh, a module on practice, a set of modules on world history or culture, module on practice. The, mo the practice modules are two days of class. The culture sections will be two weeks of class, back and forth, three times. And dealing with the three major areas of world history, early agriculture, rise of world empires, and the axial age, which is a terrible term, uh, the compromised term, but kind of deals with that period from 500 to 1500 AD, uh, where religions rise in, the, in Europe and also in Asia, and a lot of interesting stuff culturally is happening in Mesoamerica. So uh, for each of these things, we need to touch on the era-based themes. We need to get people into teams. We need to have goal-driven exploration of content, uh, goal-driven exploration of this cult these cultures. In other words, we need to use all the, te the, the assets of LARP to get people engaged in the contents of these cultures to make the culture games work. And we have to use all the aspects of LARP to get people engaged in the practices and actually doing the practices of, his of historians as much as possible during the, the, uh, the research games, the scholarship games. And we want, to do it, we want it to be done in teams because that will increase connections. That will increase effectiveness. It will get people talking beyond just the classroom. 
Here's the deep theory stuff. There's an idea of post holding. You want to give people a set of knowledge somewhere. Um, you want to get to go deep into that knowledge, and that will create a island of expertise. Now, different people are going to create different islands of expertise, but they're going to be in groups, and they're going to be collaborating on problems. So this social interaction allows each person's island island of expertise to become a place where they have something to share with everyone else. Right? They become leaders in some leaders and mentors in some knowledge area, which can create over time archipelagos of knowledge. Right? Where you learn from other people, you pick up new islands of expertise, you become more knowledge more knowledgeable about different areas, and then you're learning from other people a little bit about their area as well. We become broad and deep at the same time. Um, and that, that requires collaboration, right? That requires getting people to work in teams. This will not happen alone. Instead, you just get the islands of expertise alone, where people know a little bit about something. Or you just get breadth, where people know a lot about nothing. <laughs> sometimes these islands of expertise build higher and higher and higher as people go really deep into something. And sometimes they will spread out as they want to know more uh, they get interested in a broader set of, of questions. <coughs> okay, this is essentially how our games are structured. You have historical sources. You have to retreat. This is these are the particularly the scholarship games. I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the culture games in any depth right now. Uh, generally, the way the culture games go is uh, you have an area. You you have an area, a topic that you're interested in. You look into your topic and learn a lot about it. You report on that topic back to your, your team. Your, you, uh, your, team all, your teammates all have their own topics that they report back to you, and you build this knowledge that way. That happens over a long period of time. These games are really short. They happen in a couple days. You've got to get a met We have to use a lot of metaphors. You have metaphors for historical sources. You retrieve, that, uh, you retrieve those sources. You get that data. You analyze that data. You disseminate the data. You theorize on that data. and yeah. I'm going to take one more minute, and then I'll be done. So we have these. Oh, oh wow, that was awesome. Um, we essentially are using a mechanism for getting people to do research in classrooms, but they're entirely based on metaphors, cards, uh, and and uh, pieces of information that they have to pull together to answer three questions. This is the most important part of this. Based on these, this small bit of information, what do you know? What do you suspect? And what other comments do you have on it? That's the core of primary and secondary uh, resource criticism, right? How, how, to, how to analyze primary and secondary sources. So we're making them do that in a very nano game way uh, through this, these two day games. That's it. <laughs>